Hey guys, this is Elliot the iPad Pro, and in this video I'm going to show you how to use big data like a professional. So when you search big data on YouTube, you get a lot of talks about how it's impacting society, or is it safe, or just music videos, but no one's really explaining the technology to you or showing you how to use it. And if you think about it, that's kind of insane. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to work with big data so that you can impact society. I should also say that in the United States, the news about big data makes it seem kind of dark or scary. And it's natural to be worried about new things. But I hope once you actually start using the technology, it will seem less scary. So in this video, I'm going to give you hands-on experience working with big data. We're going to go over an example of how it can be used, and then we're going to have a fast talk about whether or not it's dangerous. And if you've never programmed before, that's actually totally okay. This tutorial is made for beginners. There's some software called IO that lets you do programming on any device, and you can use that to follow along with this tutorial. I actually have another tutorial that shows you how to download this software. You also might want to watch my Introduction to Python video. That will give you a better feel for the software. So what is big data? Well, in general, I'd say it's whenever you have a data set that's too big to fit on your computer's hard drive. So this is you holding a computer. And let's say you happen to be a YouTuber. One of the first things you'll notice as a YouTuber is that all of these video files will take up a lot of space on your computer. And eventually you'll just run out of hard drive space. Now, what I think most people do in this situation is buy an external hard drive and then store all of those video files on this bigger hard drive. And if you've ever done this before, then congratulations, you've worked with big data. Now at first, storing all of your video files on an external hard drive might seem like it solves your problems, but you might run into some tricky situations in the future. For instance, let's say at the end of the year you want to make a summary video about all of the stuff you've done. And to do this, you end up taking little bits and pieces of all of the other video files that you created. But for each little piece, you have to move the entire video file over so that you can copy that individual piece. And then when you're done, you have to move the entire file back. And then this ends up taking forever because you have to do it for every single video file you created. So this might seem like a random example, but it's actually the exact same problem that programmers ran into when they were working with data sets, and it's what got people at Google to start talking about big data. So when I drew these video files, I drew them as boxes. And you might remember from math that a box of data with rows and columns is called a matrix. And up until really recently, computer scientists used to store all of their data inside of these boxes or matrices using something called SQL. So let's say you're a super successful website and you want to store all of your data using SQL. So in the first box, you might store all of the user's profiles in a matrix. Then you might have another box where you store all of the video files. And then let's say you have another box where you store all of the descriptions and info about the videos. And then how about one more box of each user's statistics? Now let's say you have one user who looks kind of suspicious, and so you want to check out their data to see if anything bad is going on. Well then what you have to do is go into every single box and pull out the tiny little piece of info about that user. Now this is annoying and takes up a lot of time, and it's also the exact same problem we saw with the YouTuber and the external hard drive. And remember that YouTube is owned by Google, so it's reasons like this that led Google to think about other ways to work with big data. So how did Google solve this problem? Well, in this video I'm going to show you two of Google's most exciting solutions, something called Cloud Firestore and Cloud Memory Store. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Firestore. And with Firestore, you don't store your data inside of boxes. So instead of mixing together everybody's data in boxes, imagine if each user gets their own little data set. Now the first little circle might have just the user's username. But then that top circle can lead down to other circles. And these circles might contain stuff like the user's info, their statistics, their homepage, and then their videos. So now if you want to find the data from that one suspicious user, you can first go to the top circle and then grab all of the other information right from there. And this ends up being way faster and easier to do. Okay, so now we're going to set up Firestore on Google Cloud. This makes it so that we can start using this really cool database in IO. So first, you should have IO already set up from the previous tutorial. 
Now go to the options and then scroll down until you see Firestore and then click it and click data. Now Google will give you a few different options about how you want to set up your database and they'll ask you if you want to use Firestore or something else called data store. So Firestore is Google's favorite way to work with big data, and it's the way that I recommend. Firestore is way simpler to use, but they still have data store there for people who are still figuring out how to switch over. Now, this brings up a really important point, and that's that in computer science, things change really fast. You know how I said Firestore is just one year old? Well, Memory Store is just six months old. And probably in two years, there'll be something else totally new, and this video will be obsolete and not worth watching. So if you want to be a computer scientist, you have to constantly be searching and learning new things. But there is some good news, and that's that all knowledge builds upon the previous stuff. So Firestore is just an upgraded version of Data Store. So I was able to learn Firestore in one day, and the more stuff you learn, the easier it gets. You're going to want to use the latest version of Firestore in native mode. Click select there. And this brings us to the screen where we set up Firestore. Now, you might have noticed that the screen changed. So this is really annoying, but the page wouldn't load on my iPad. So I switched over to my laptop so I could finish the setup. Now, once this is set up, you can do all of your coding and work on a tablet. So if the only thing you've got is an iPad, then use the school's computer or your friend's for this one part. Also, I'd at least check if this works on an iPad. Hopefully by the time you watch this video, Google's got this working. Okay, so let's get back to actually creating our Firestore database. So remember, when we created our I.O. computer, we had to decide the physical location of where that computer is running. Well, in Firestore, we do the exact same thing. We have to select the location of where we want the Firestore database to be. Since my I.O. computer is running in a U.S. Central zone, I'm going to select U.S. Central for Firestore as well. Now, Firestore doesn't have to run at the same location of your actual computer, but it'll make things a lot smoother, so I definitely recommend it. Then click Create Database, and we'll see the database start spinning up. Once Firestore is up, you'll come to a page that looks like this. So one cool thing about Firestore is that you don't even need to code to start building your database. So let's consider the example I was talking about before, where you're trying to build a database for YouTube. Well, the first thing you might want is a place where you store all of the YouTubers' data. So click Start Collection, and we'll call this collection YouTubers. So when you're using Firestore, you'll see the words collection and document popping up a lot. So you can think of collections as being your folders, and of documents as being another word for files. And in this case, your files are your data. Let's create our first piece of data. And since I'm a YouTuber, let's call it the iPad Pro. Then we can add some info about me. For instance, let's add my channel page. If I want to add more data about me, I can click Add Field. Let's say we want to add how many subscribers I have. Since this is a number, let's change field type from string to number. And since I'm just starting out, right now I have 700 subscribers. Then click Save to add your first data to Firestore. But let's say you want to add more YouTubers to your database. For instance, there's Eugene Kortoyansky, who does some great physics videos. Well, to add him, just click Add Document. And then in Document ID, type Eugene Kortoyansky. Now, his channel can be found right here, and I definitely recommend checking it out. So let's add that to our database. And he has about 400,000 subscribers. So let's make sure to add that number as well. Then when we click Save, we see Eugene's in our database as well. Now if you want, you can add more folders and files of data here by adding collections and documents. As an exercise, try adding your favorite YouTuber. Now when you're done with that, the next step is to get I.O. to work with Firestore. To do this, go to Options, and then go to IAM Admin, and click Service Accounts. Service accounts is where you decide who has access to your Google Cloud and Firestore. To give your I.O. computer access to Firestore, click Create Service Account. Let's call our service account I.O.-Firestore, and then click Create. Now in Service Account Permissions, we decide what we want I.O. to control. First off, I.O. should have control of this project. So in Select a Role, add Project Editor. Now we also need to give I.O. control of Firestore, so click Add Another Role, 
and then scroll down to Cloud Firestore and click Cloud Firestore Editor. Then click Continue. Now we have to create a key. So a key gives IO the ability to open the door to Firestore. I'm going to cover how keys work in a later video, but for now, click Create Key and then click Create. Now you'll see this little file download onto your computer. This file is your key. We give IO this key by going to the main page of our computer and then uploading the key to IO. So one really important thing about security, make sure you put this key in your main page and never put it inside of one of your public folders. Remember, this key gives you access to your Firestore, but if you put it up online, then everybody in the world has access to your database. But that's it, we've now set up Firestore on IO. So congratulations, you now have access to Google's most popular system for big data. But before we check it out in IO, let's also set up Memory Store. So to set up Memory Store, go to Options, and then scroll down and click Memory Store. But before we continue, what is Memory Store and why do I think it's so revolutionary? So remember from before, there used to be this old way of storing data called SQL, but that had some problems, so Google just recently invented something called Firestore. Now what makes Firestore special is that it changed the way that data was stored. So you might be asking, if Google solved the problem with Firestore, why do we even need Memory Store? So when you use Firestore, data goes from your computer on IO over to another hard drive, which has Firestore. But with Memory Store, that data doesn't go to another hard drive. Instead, that data is stored in RAM, also called memory. So memory is way faster than a hard drive. Your computer at home might have four to eight gigs of memory. But with Memory Store, you can give your I.O. computer up to 300 gigs of RAM. Now you might be thinking, 300 gigs? I thought this was big data. How is that special? But with Memory Store, it's not about how much space you have. It's about how you're able to use it. So right now, you probably only have one computer running I.O. But you could always create more if you wanted to. So let's say you created a second computer. Well now, all of a sudden, both of those computers can access and control the same data that's in memory. And with Google Cloud, you don't just need to have one or two computers, you can have tens of thousands of computers. So when you hear people talking about how powerful a CPU is, one of the things they mention is the number of cores on the CPU. Each core is a little box that does computation. And the reason why the number of cores is important is because you can divide your computer's work between the cores. Also, all of these cores share the same memory. Now in Memory Store, since all of your computers share the same memory, you can think of each computer as just being one core for doing computation. So let's check out the latest, most powerful CPUs online. Now the latest chip from Intel is the i9. And right now, for almost $2,000, you can get a computer that has 16 cores. And remember, when you buy a chip like this, you're probably going to buy another one in two or three years because it's obsolete. And actually, I'd say this chip is already obsolete because using Memory Store, you can basically spin up a 30,000 core computer. And as for your computer's hard drive, well, for that, you just use Firestore. So in Google Cloud, you can build these insanely powerful supercomputers, but they still follow the same basic idea of just your computer at home. But now each individual computer you create is just one CPU core, and your memory is now called Memory Store, and then your hard drive is called Fire Store. Now, someone who knows computer science will be quick to tell you that I'm overgeneralizing stuff, but I hope that from this, you can understand just how insanely powerful cloud computing is. For the first time, chemists and biologists can build their own supercomputers. And not just that, these computers are probably easier and more powerful than the supercomputer on campus. In fact, I bet that from these tutorials, you'll have kids in elementary school building supercomputers and designing new architectures. And when you give people that level of power, it changes what's possible. All right, now let's get back to setting up Memory Store. Now for this, I'm back on my laptop and Google should really fix up their website for other devices. Inside Memory Store, click Create Instance. 
So let's give our memory store a name. How about IO Memory? Now there's only one more step to setting this up, and that's deciding the location. It's really important to choose the same location as where you set up your IO computer, because that will make things run a lot faster. And so just in general, I've noticed that new technology usually shows up for beta testing in zone US Central 1C. Now, I don't know if that's actually always true, but I recommend selecting that zone if you're in the United States. And then when you click Create, you'll actually have everything set up for Memory Store. Now, Google Cloud is insanely powerful, and there's a lot of other stuff you can do with it. But for now, let's check out Memory Store and Fire Store on IO. Okay, we have everything set up, and I really want to show you how to use this stuff in IO. But this video is getting pretty long, and I think I have to break it up into two parts. So in the next video, you'll jump into coding with Firestore and Memory Store. And I'll give a real-life example of how these things make new ideas possible. Also, I'll talk about the potential dangers that can come from these technologies. But what do you think? Did these new tools I showed you make you excited? Scared? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, click like and subscribe. This is Elliot the iPad Pro. See you guys next video.